Clear as Mud by Paul Jennings. I'm undone. Yes, I know, I'm a fink, a rat, a creep. Nobody likes Eric Mud, and it's all my own fault. But I don't deserve this. I look in the mirror and I see a face that's not a face. I peel back my gloves and see a hand that's not a hand. I pull off my socks and see feet that aren't feet. I look down my pants and see... No, I'm not going to describe that. Oh, merciful heavens. Please, please, I don't deserve this. Do I? It all began with Osborne, the nerd. See, he was a brain box. He always did his homework. He played the piano. He collected insects. The teachers liked him. You know the type. I spotted him on his first day at school. New kid. All alone on the end of the bench. Trying not to look worried. Pretending to be interested in what was inside his bright yellow lunchbox. Making out he wasn't worried about sitting by himself. Look at it, I jeered. Poor little thing. It's got a lovely lunchbox. The band-aid on it. Has it hurt itself? Silly creep looked around the schoolyard. He saw everyone eating out of brown paper bags. No one in the school ever ate out of a lunchbox, especially one with the owner's name written on it in Band-Aid. Osborne went red. G'day, he said. I'm Nigel Osborne. I'm new here. He even held out his hand. What a wimp. I just turned around and walked off. I would have given him a few other things to think about, but my mate Simmons had just seen something else interesting. Look, yelled Simmons, a parker. There's a dag down in the oval wearing a parker. We hurried off to stir up the wimp in the parker, and after that we had a bit of fun with the kid covered in pimples. A few days went by and still Osborne had no friends. Simmons and I made sure of that. One day after school we grabbed him and made him miss his bus. Another time we pinched his glasses, flushed them down the loo. Never missed a chance to make Osborne's life miserable. He wandered around the schoolyard like a bee in a garden of dead flowers, completely alone. Until the day he found the beetle. A credit to the whole school, said old Kempy, the school principal. Nigel Osborne has brought honour to us, to the town. In fact, to the whole nation. Couldn't understand what he was raving about. It was only a beetle. And here was the school principal going on as if Osborne had invented ice cream. Kempy droned on. This is not just a beetle, he said. This is a new beetle, a new species. It's never been before recorded. He waved the jar at the kids. What a bore. Everyone except me peered into the jar. This is an ant-eating beetle, said Kempy. It eats live ants. He looked over at me. Eric Mudd, pay attention, he said. I just yawned loudly and picked my teeth. At that very moment, the beetle grabbed one of the ants that was crawling on the inside wall of the jar. The beetle pushed the ant into its small mouth disappeared, legs twitching as it went. Osborne stood there, staring at his shoes, pretending to be modest. What a nerve. He needed to be put back in his box. But that would have to wait. Old Kempy was still droning on. He stopped and took a breath. This species will probably be named after Nigel Osborne, he said. Necro Necrophorus Osborne. Necrophorus nerdhead, I whispered loudly. A few kids laughed. Kempy went on with his speech. This is the only beetle of its type ever seen. An expert from the museum is coming to fetch it tomorrow. Till then, it will be locked in the science room. No one is to enter that room without permission. It would be a tragedy if this beetle were to be lost. My mind started to tick over. A tragedy, eh? Well, well, well. It was midnight. Dark clouds killed the moon. I wrapped my fist in a towel and smashed it through the window. The sound of broken glass tinkled across the science room floor. Once inside, I flashed a beam of light along the shelves. Where are you, Beetle? Where are you, little nerd head? I whispered. Come to Daddy. It was harder than I thought. The science room was crammed full of animals and bottles. Snakes, lizards, spiders. So many dead creatures that it was hard to find the live one that I wanted. Then I saw it. On the top shelf, a large jar containing a beetle and some ants. I reached up and then froze. Somewhere in the distance... A key turned in the lock. The security guard. Strike. I couldn't get caught. Old Kempy had already warned me. One more bit of trouble and he would kick me out of school. I scrambled out of the window. A jagged piece of glass cut my leg. It hurt like crazy, but I didn't care. Pain never worries me. I'm not a wimp like Osborne. I ran across the oval and into the dark shadows of the night. I held the beetle jar above my head. I'd done it. Back home in the safety of my bedroom, 
I examined my prize. The beetle sat still, watching, waiting. It was covered in crazy colours, red, green and gold, with black legs. It was about the size of a coat button. I looked at the ants. They didn't know what it was in store for them. Beetle food. They were queer looking ants too. I'd never seen any of them like that before. They were sort of clear. You could see right through them. The beetle suddenly grabbed one and ate it, right in front of my eyes. It was funny really. This was the only one of these beetles that had ever been found. This could be the last specimen. There might be no more in the world. And in the morning, I was going to flush it down the loo. What a joke. But the next day, I changed my mind. There was no hurry. I shoved the jar in the cupboard and went to school. Played it real cool. Didn't tell anybody what I'd done. You never know who you can trust these days. Old Kempy wasn't too pleased. In fact, he was as mad as a hornet. Gathered the whole school together in the assembly hall. Last night, he said slowly, someone broke into the science room and stole our beetle. His eyes roved over the heads of all the kids. He stopped when he reached me. He stared into my eyes. But I just stared back. He couldn't prove a thing. He was just an old bore. But his next words weren't boring at all. Not at all. The school council, he said, is offering a reward of $200 for information which leads to the arrest of the thief. Or $200 for another specimen. Nigel Osborne's beetle was found in the National Park. Any beetle hunters should search there. Old Kempy looked at Osborne. You needn't worry, Nigel, he said. We have photos. The new species will still be named after you. Rats! The little wimp was still going to be famous. I walked home slowly. An idea started to form in my head. What if I kept the beetle for a few weeks? Then I'd pretend I found another one in the National Park. No one would know the difference. And I would be famous. They might even name it after me. Necrophorus Mud. I raced home and grabbed the jar. The ants were gone. Eaten alive. I tipped the beetle onto the table, picked it up. Its little legs waved helplessly at the ceiling. This was the beetle that was making Osborne famous? Didn't like that beetle. I gave it a squeeze. Then it bit me. I yelled and dropped the beetle on the floor. I was mad. You rotten little, I said. I lifted up a boot to squash the stupid thing. Then I remembered the $200 reward. I scooped the beetle up and put it back in the jar. Jumped into bed, but I couldn't sleep. My finger throbbed where the beetle had bitten me. I had a nightmare. I dreamed that I was a pane of glass in the science room window, and that someone with a towel around their fist punched a hole right through me. I screamed and sat up in bed. It was morning. My hand throbbed like crazy. I held it up in front of my face. I couldn't believe what I saw. A cold wave of fear grabbed my guts. My legs trembled. My heart missed a beat. I could see right into my finger. From the middle knuckle, right down to the tip of my nail was clear, transparent. The bones, tendons, the nerves and blood vessels, I could see them all. It was as if the flesh of my fingertip had changed into clear plastic. I rubbed my eyes with my other hand. I shook my head. This was a nightmare. Let it be a dream, I moaned. I rushed to the sink and splashed my face with cold water. Then I looked again. Still there. I was a freak with a see-through finger. I felt faint. The room seemed to wobble around me. No one in the world had a see-through finger. Kids at school would laugh, sneer, joke about me. People are like that. Pick on anyone who's different. I couldn't tell a soul. Not my old man. Not my old lady. Especially not Simmons. Couldn't trust him an inch. He would turn on me for sure. Breakfast was hard to eat with gloves on, but I managed it. Then I headed off for school. Stumbled along the road, hardly knowing where I was going. I was so upset. I didn't even feel like stirring Juggiers Jensen, and hardly noticed the Sheila with the pimples. Didn't have the heart to give a bit of stick to the kid in the parka. It was just my luck to have old Kempy for his first period. I know you're into fashion, Mud, he said, but you might as well face it. Can't use a keyboard with gloves on. Take them off. I can tell you my knees started to knock. I couldn't let anyone see my creepy finger. Chill, Blaines, I said. I have to wear gloves. Old Kempy gave a snort and turned away, stuck two glove fingers up behind his back. As soon as the bell rang, I bolted to the toilets, shut myself in one of the cubicles, peeled the glove off my left hand. Yep, perfectly normal. Flesh was pink, firm, and then, with fumbling fingers, I ripped off the other glove. I nearly fainted. 
whole hand was clear as glass. I could see the tendons pulling, the blood flowing, the bones moving at the joints. Horrible, horrible, horrible. The beetle disease was spreading. With shaking fingers, I ripped at my shirt buttons. I couldn't bear to look. Hideous, revolting. I could see my breakfast slowly squirming inside my stomach. My lungs, like two pink bags, filled and emptied as I watched. I stared in horror at my diaphragm, pumping up and down. Arteries twisted and coiled. Fluids flowed and sucked. My kidneys slowly swayed like two giant beans. My guts revealed their terrible secrets. I could see the lot. Bare bones, flesh and gushing blood. I strangled a cry. I felt sick. I rushed to the bowl and heaved. I saw my stomach bloat and shrink. The contents rushed up a transparent tube into my throat and out into the loo. This was a nightmare. How much of me was see-through? I inspected every inch of my body. Everything was normal down below. My legs were okay, and my left arm. So far, only my stomach, chest, and right arm were infected. Blood vessels ran everywhere like fine tree roots. I wanted to check my back, but I couldn't. Simmons and I had smashed the toilet mirrors a couple of weeks ago. The bell for the next class sounded. I was late, but it didn't matter. We had Hancock for English. New teacher, just out of college. He was scared of me. He wouldn't say a thing when I walked in late. I covered up my lungs, liver, kidneys and bones and headed off for class. So far, my secret was safe. Nothing was showing. All the kids were talking and mucking around. No one was listening to poor old Hancock. He couldn't control the class. One or two kids looked up as I walked in. Silence spread through the room. Mouths dropped open. Eyeballs bulged. Everyone was staring at me, as if I was a freak. Jack McGovern jumped to his feet and let out an enormous scream. Hancock fainted. The class erupted, running, rat scared, yelling, scrambling, scratching. They ripped at the folding doors at the back of the room, falling over each other, crushing, crashing, anything to get away from me. What is it? What had they seen? Everything was covered. I checked myself again. Hands, feet, ankles, hip, chest, face. Face. I rushed to the window and stared at my reflection. A grinning skull stared back. A terrible throbbing spectre was traced with red and purple veins. My jellied nose was lined with wet bristles. A liquid tongue swallowed behind glassy cheeks. My eyeballs glared back at me. They floated inside two black hollows. That's when I fainted. When I awoke, I remembered my dream. Thank goodness it was all over. I grinned with relief and held my hand in front of my face. I could see right through it. I shouted in rage and flopped back on the bed. It wasn't a nightmare. It was real. I ripped away my crisp white sheets. I was dressed in a hospital gown. I pulled it up and examined myself. I was transparent down to the tip of my toes. It was horrible. See-through sideshow freak. I rushed over to the window. A silent crowd had assembled outside. Two police cars were parked by the curb. Television cameras were pointed my way. The mob stared up at the hospital, trying to catch a glimpse of the unspeakable ghoul inside. Me. They wanted to dissect me, discuss me, display me. I despised them all. Whackers, wimps, the world was full of them. The mob would pay hundreds for a photo, thousands for a story, maybe millions for an interview. They made me sick. I knew their type. I pulled back the curtains, stretched my bare body for all to see. Inside and out, blood and bone, gut and gristle. I showed them the lot. A low moan swept through the crowd. People screamed. Cameras flashed and whirred, clicking, clacking, staring, shouting. They leered and laughed, mocking monsters, ordinary people. A doctor hurried into the room, carrying a tray. He grabbed me and tried to push me back into the bed. I was too strong for him. I shoved a veined hand into his face and pushed him off. I could feel my fingers inside his mouth. He choked and gurgled as he fell. He scrambled to his feet and fled. I pulled on my clothes and with shirt flapping, swept down the corridor. Nurses and doctors and police grabbed at me weakly, but they had no stomach for it. Like children touching a dead animal, they trembled as I passed. The crowd at the curb fell back in horror. I raised my arms to the heavens and roared. They turned and ran, dropping cameras and shopping bags, littering the road with their fear. I set off down the empty streets, loping for home, looking for a lair. It wasn't far to go. I kicked the front door open and saw my old lady standing there. She tried to scream, but nothing came out. She turned and ran for her life. She hadn't even recognised her own son. I growled to myself. I pushed food into a knapsack. Meat, 
bread, clothes, boots, a knife, and the beetle still in its jar. It charged out into the backyard and scrambled over the fence, then I headed for the mountains. Up I went, up, up, up into the forest. No one followed. Not at first. The sun baked the tractor powder. The bush waited, buzzing, shimmering, slumbering in the summer heat. I was heading for the furthest hills, the deepest bush, a place where no one could see my shame. I decided to live in the forest forever. No one was going to gawk at me. I hated people who were different. And now I was one of a kind. When my food ran out, I would hunt. There was plenty to eat. Wallabies, possums, snakes, even lyrebirds. After five or six hours of trudging through the forest, I started to get a strange feeling. Almost as if I was being followed. Every now and then, a stick would break. Once I thought I even heard a bit of a howl. Crawled underneath the fern and waited. Soon, the noises grew louder. I was being followed. I grabbed my knife and hunched down, ready to spring. Scatter, jump, lollop, dribble. Would you believe it was a dog? A rotten, half-grown puppy scampered into view. Ah, oh, buzz off! I yelled. Scram! Beat it! Stupid dog jumped around my feet. I kicked out at it, but missed. It thought I was playing. The last thing I wanted was a dog yapping and giving me away. I threw a stone at it, and it missed. The dog yelped off into the bush. It didn't give up. It just followed a long way back. In the end, I gave up. I could teach it to hunt and kill. It might be useful. Come here, hopeless, I said. The stupid thing came and licked my arm. Its tongue flowed along my clear liquid skin. It didn't seem to mind that I was transparent. Dogs don't care if their owners are ugly, inside or out. Night fell, but I dared not light a fire. I huddled in a blanket inside a hollow tree. Hopeless tried to get in too, to warm himself, but I kicked him out. The mutt probably had fleas. I found a couple of ants in the wood. Food. Not for me. I opened the jar, dropped the ants inside. Then I watched the beetle stuff its dinner into its mouth. I looked at the beetle with hatred. It had caused all this trouble. I was going to make it pay. One day, I said, one day, little beetle, I'm going to eat you. For three weeks, I tramped through the forest, deeper and deeper. There were no tracks, no signs of human life, just me and Hopeless. We ate possums and rats and berries. At night, we shivered in caves and under logs. There were leeches, march flies, cold, heat, dust, mud. On and on I went. The ugly boy and the stupid dog. Sometimes I would hear a helicopter, dogs barking, a faint whistle on the air, but in the end we left them far behind. We were safe, deep in the deepest forest. I found a cave, warm, dry and empty. I looked down into a clear, rushing river. There'd be fish for sure. Hopeless liked the cave too. Stupid mutt ran around sniffing and wagging its tail. It's the first laugh I'd had for ages. Oh how I laughed. I cackled till the tears ran down my face to see that dog wag its tail, its long, clear tail, with the bones showing through the skin and the veins weaving their way in and out. Hopeless had the see-through disease. What a joke. It was catching. In the morning, most of the dog was see-through. The only bit to stay normal was its head. It had a hairy dog's head, but the rest of its bones and lungs and kidneys and blood vessels. Just like me. I held up a bit of dead possum. Big, I said. Big. It did too. It sat up and begged. I didn't give it the possum. There wasn't enough to share around. We stayed in that cave for ten years, the three of us. Me, Hopeless, and the Beetle. I was like Robinson Crusoe. I set up the cave with homemade furniture. In the end, it was quite comfortable. Every day I fed that beetle. Two ants a day. I kept him alive for ten years, can you believe it? Every day I told the beetle the same thing. When I'm twenty-four, I told it. I'm going to eat you to celebrate 10 years in the bush. Not once did I think of going back to civilization. I wasn't going to be a joke. Looked at. Inspected. Once they found out the disease was catching, no one would come near me anyway. They would lock me up. Put me in quarantine. Examine me like a specimen. I could never go back. I was 14 when I went into that forest. And I was 24 when I left it. See, it happened like this. On my 24th birthday, I decided to have a little party. A special meal, just for me. Something I've been looking forward to for many years. I grabbed the beetle jar and made a speech. Beetle, I said, I am an outcast, an ugly see-through monster. I've lived here with you and Hopeless for ten years. In all that time, I've not seen a human face. I 
I haven't spoken a word. I want to go home, but I can't. Now I pass sentence on to you. I sentence you to be eaten alive. Come to daddy, beetle. The beetle waved its legs. It almost seemed to know what was going to happen. I tipped it out of the jar and put it inside my mouth. Held up my mirror and watched it roaming about in there. I could see it through my clear, clear cheeks. It sniffed. It snuffed. It searched around, trying to find a way out. It had to look down the hole at the back, but didn't like what it saw. It backed out. Then, it bit me on the tongue. I screamed and spat the beetle out onto the floor of the cave. I stamped on it with my boot and squashed it into pulp. Then I rinsed my mouth out with water from the creek. I spat and coughed. The pain was terrible. My tongue started to swell. I held up the mirror to my face, stuck out my tongue to get a good look, because I couldn't see it properly through my cheeks. Couldn't see it properly through my cheeks? I couldn't see it at all through my cheeks. The pinkish bluish was spreading over my face. Eyelids, lips, nose. My skin was returning to normal. I couldn't see my spine. My skull was covered by normal hair and flesh. My chin sprouted a dark beard. I just sat there and watched as the normal colour slowly spread over my body. Skin, lovely skin. It moved down my neck, over my chest, down my legs. By the next day, I was a regular human being. Not a kidney or lung to be seen. One bite of the beetle had made me see through, and another had cured me. I could go home. I looked like everyone else again. Hopeless came and licked me on the face. I pushed him away with a scream. The dog was still clear. I could see a bit of bush rat passing through his stomach. He was still see-through. What if he reinfected me? Turned me back into a creepy horror. He'd just lick my face. I might catch the disease back from Hopeless. I sat down and I thought about it. There was no way I was going to go home unless I completely cured. I decided to stay for another month just to be on the safe side. Every night I slept with Hopeless. I breathed his breath. I even shared his fleas, but nothing happened. I stayed normal and Hopeless stayed see-through. You couldn't get the disease twice. It was like measles or mumps. You couldn't catch it again. Maybe if the beetle bit you again you'd get it. But the beetle was dead. There was no way I would ever be a freak again. I packed up my things and headed for home. This was going to be great. I would be famous. The return of the see-through man and his dog. I would be normal. But not hopeless. He was still a walking bunch of bones and innards. I could put him on show. Charge hundreds of dollars for a look. People would come from everywhere to see the dog with see-through stomach. I'd be a millionaire in no time. Hopeless was a valuable dog. It was a rough trip back through the deep undergrowth and rugged mountains, but finally the day came. Hopeless and I stood on the edge of a clearing and stared at a building. It was a little rural school, tight with one teacher and about 15 kids. It was a perfect place for me to reappear. They'd have a phone. They could ring the papers and the TV. A man from the mountains could go home in style. Still, I was worried. I mustn't frighten them. Hopeless was a scary sight. The teacher and the kids would never have seen a dog with its guts showing before. I decided to tie Hopeless up. I didn't want anything to happen to him. But it was too late. Hopeless bounded off across the grass towards the school. Come back, you dumb dog, I yelled. Come back, or I'll put the boot into you. Hopeless didn't take a bit of notice. He charged across the grass and into the school building. I waited for the screams of horror. Waited for the students to flee out of the building and run down the road. Waited for the yelling and fainting. What if the teacher shot Hopeless? I wouldn't have anything to show. Dead dog was no good. Don't! I yelled. Don't! I ran and ran. Then I stopped outside the window. I heard excited voices. Good dog! Good dog! said a child's voice. Here boy! said another. Something's wrong. They weren't scared of him. Surely Hopeless hadn't changed back too. Couldn't happen that quickly. I charged into the schoolroom. The teacher and the kids were all patting Hopeless. His gut still swirled about in full view. His dinner still swirled in his stomach. The bones in his tail swished for all to see. But the kids weren't scared. Not until they saw me. A little girl pointed at me and tried to say something. Then they began screaming, shouting, clawing at the windows. They were filled with horror. They'd never seen anything as horrible as me before. The teacher could see the kids were terrified. Out the back, he yelled at the children. Quickly! The kids charged out of the back door and the teacher followed. I was alone in the classroom. I looked at the pictures of the see-through people on the walls. I looked at the photos of the see-through people in the textbooks. In India. In China. In England. 
I looked at the photo of our see-through Prime Minister and America's see-through President. I stared out the window at the see-through children running in fear down the road, followed by a perfectly normal see-through dog. And I realised then, as I realise now, that I'm the only person in the world who has their innards covered by horrible pink skin. I'm still a freak, and I don't deserve it. Do I?